Howdy, geographers. How you doing? Good to see you. Not that I can see you. Um, okay, so, so this is the introductory lecture for ABC's uh, Antelope Valley Colleges. Uh, what is it? Geography 221, Spatial Analysis in GIS. I think that's how we phrase it. It's, uh, this is the spatial analysis course of the GIS courses that we offer for our certificate. Okay, that's that's why you're here. That's what I'm going to be talking about. All right, I'm sure in all in the description it will look very professional. I'll explain all of this in the actual video itself. And that I mean just to you know to put it all out on the table right now. Clearly, this is not where I'm comfortable. Um, just you know speaking to myself in a room, pretending that I'm actually lecturing in a classroom setting. This is ridiculous, but. It's so what we're gonna do here. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to step outside of of where I'm comfortable and and do this uh, this remote learning stuff here. I'd much rather be in a classroom with you. I'd much rather see your reactions as yeah, I'm discussing stuff and and be able to to tweak what I'm saying accordingly. But hey, what are you gonna do? We we'll get through this. We'll uh, we'll do it. So I'm going to try to sit still. I'm going to try to not, you know, gesticulate wildly and all the stuff I usually do in a classroom. I'd be much more comfortable pacing back and forth, but I don't have, you know, a camera person or anything like that. Instead, I have an iPhone taped to a ridiculous setup uh, that seems to be working, so we're going to go through it. All right, so, all right. Anyway, back to, to what we're doing here. So this is the introductory lecture here, by the way. I'm I'm Mike Paces. Uh, I'm teaching the the class. Um, yeah, you don't need my background. You can you can look it up. But but I've, I've done some GIS uh, in the day. And so what I'm going to do is uh, take my own professional background as well as the academic background. I'm going to bring all of this stuff together to try to give you guys a course that is it's that's actually useful. That's one issue I have with some of these GIS courses, other ones I've taken or sat in on or whatever, is that for a lot of them, they're, they're a little too abstract or they're a little too neatly contained or too positive in the sense that they, they make it seem like everything works all of the time. And what I like to do, it because, because GIS, when you're working in it, oh good lord, it does not work all of the time. Usually it doesn't work. Uh, that's That's typical, right? That you're project, whatever thing it is you're trying to do, whatever answer you're trying to get, it's going to be a disaster, quite frankly, 90% of the time, initially anyway. And the trick is you need to figure out, okay, what, what am I doing? What do I need to do to not have this disaster, right? To fix this, to make this work. And so that's, that's one thing to just keep in mind. GIS is a messy, complex, frustrating field of study and industry in which to work, um, but it can also be quite rewarding because of that. All right, so keep that in mind always. Remember, the struggle is means you're doing it right. If you're not struggling as you're going through this stuff, you're not, you're not pushing yourself. You're not actually asking good questions, right, or seeking meaningful answers or, or anything like that, not tackling the real, the real challenges and problems that are out there. We don't want to play it safe. We want to push so that we can get, I don't know, we can get some some knowledge, some information. We can figure stuff out, uh, you know, and hopefully make things better as we figure this stuff out. So, so that said, the, my goal with this class and what I want you to take from it as you successfully complete it is number one, I want you to learn how to ask better questions. Okay, whatever your research is, and I say research in a very I don't know, generic sense, because I realize that that a the term research can can conjure specific images, and so you may you know I may say research, you may think of someone you know working in a laboratory or coming through books in a library or whatever. Um, but I'm I'm saying you know the reason you're learning GIS, you're trying to learn something that will allow you to to ask questions and get answers, right? Solve problems, that, that kind of stuff. That's your research. However it is you go about it, that's gonna be you know, determined by where it is you're working, 
right? What industry or discipline or whatever are you are you dealing with here? Right? Some of you are interested in, in field sciences, whether it's you know ecology, um, you know archaeology stuff, kind of broad geography, um, field work in general, you know whatever it might be. So we've got that. Uh, some of you are interested in more kind of you know in the lab analytical stuff. Totally fine, kind of means the same thing. And then others still are, you know, business majors or administration of justice uh, majors. You want to get into crime mapping and analysis, you know, whatever it might be. It might seem weird to use a term like research, or it might not seem like some of the stuff I'm talking about fits, but it's all a generic, general concept of you're asking questions to try to get answers. And the key, as I'll try to make clear, throughout future lectures and, and the work you do in here, the key is to ask the right questions, all right? Because if you're not, well, then, I mean, you so what you get an answer it might not actually help you at all, right? Or maybe you can't get that answer you're really looking for, and it turns out it's not because that answer is impossible. It's just you haven't figured out how to phrase that question. What should I be asking? And once you figure out that question, Based on some of the things you're going to be learning in this class, you'll go, okay, here's how I can go about solving it, right? How I can work toward that answer. So the key thing is to really get you thinking about the questions you're asking. And then the second deal here too, and it, it ties in with it, but I, I want to make sure that you, you are aware of uh, and can therefore avoid some common problems that come from spatial analysis, especially within GIS. The technology is fantastic. Ish. I'll, I'll say ish. You'll see. I mean, I'm not I'm not thrilled with, with some of the technology out there. Mainly it's the the very inherently capitalist profit-driven nature of, of said technology and how when you you know what question to ask, but you can't afford to easily you know answer it. Um that that's the frustrating part. But honestly, the technology is incredible. What we can do with GIS software and the hardware we have and, and all of that today, it's it's amazing. But because it's so easy to do, assuming you have access to it, assuming you can afford it, because it's so easy to ask some of these questions, we, we sometimes we don't even think about the fact that, oh, I shouldn't be asking it this way. Uh, and we, so we get these answers thinking that, oh, we, we've done this brilliant scientific analysis, and, and in reality, it's it's garbage, right? Because we're not thinking carefully uh, about this. So there are some key problems that we all run through. As we're, we're starting out doing this kind of work, uh, you know, especially working in GIS, it, it, every student goes through this. And what you need to do is be made aware of it. And then continue to test yourself and always ask as you're doing this work, does this make sense, right? Does What I'm doing here, does it actually make sense? Am I producing an actual answer to this question or this problem? Or am I just kind of moving some stuff around and making a pretty map or pretty chart or whatever at the end, right? So that's, that's something to think about here. Um, okay, so first thing, let's define... GIS to start with, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're thinking about this, I don't know, in a useful way. So like right off the bat, GIS, it's an acronym, right? Those letters stand for something. So it's Geographic Information Systems. It's a terrible, terrible name. It's a terrible collection of words. It's clunky. It's I've always hated it because it just sounds so I don't know clinical and and just it, it sounds like a, a side effect of a, a drug or, or something like that right you know like I oh yeah I got I got this vaccine I'm, I'm happy about that but for a week I had GIS and you know oh it was rough I, I don't know it just it doesn't sound good it, it, it makes it sound you know what it is it makes it sound like a thing right or like a noun but we shouldn't think of it that way. We shouldn't think of a GIS as a noun. We should instead think of it as a, a verb, right? It's something you do. It's not just a thing that you can, you know, look at and, and feel and see, you know, all the 
different stuff there. It's it's an action. It's something we are doing. And you can think of it like a tool, which which is a noun. I really, the whole noun, don't get too hung up on the noun and the verb stuff. It doesn't all. This is how my brain works. It, it makes sense in my head, not necessarily logically, if you write it down. Um, but if we think about it as as a tool, it's it's something that we're not even just interested in the tool itself, right? Like like if we say it's a hammer, we're not just interested in the hammer for the hammer's sake, right? We want to get a hammer because we need to use the hammer to do something, to build something, to fix something, whatever it might be, right? Um, so that's that's what we do, right? We get that tool to be able to accomplish something. It's not about the noun itself. It's about that that action, that act of creating, fixing, repairing, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. That's what we're doing with GIS. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do GIS. And the cool thing about GIS is it's not just one tool, right? It's not just a hammer or a screwdriver or a pry bar or whatever it might be. It's a whole collection of tools. There's a ridiculous amount of tools that are at our disposal if we learn how to use them. And so, and that's, you know, that's what you're doing here, right? I'm going to be teaching you how to use a big chunk of these tools here. But the key is, the key should always be, it's not about the tools themselves. It's how can we use the tools to do something. So think about that as you're going through here. Think about what it is you hope to accomplish. Like if you're, you know, early on in your college career and you're thinking about, you know, your major and what you're going to study, what you're going to do, what is your career going to be, right? Think about how GIS can help you with that career. That's the, the best way to do it. And that's not to say you can't just get excited about the tool itself, learn how to make better tools and all that. That's also uh, an avenue of study here. But from what I've learned, for most of you students who are, are taking this stuff, this kind of class, you've got some goal in mind and you're taking this class to be able to help you reach that other goal. Not to be necessarily a straight GIS person, but a biologist who uses GIS, right? Or a, a crime analyst who uses GIS or something like that. So think of it that way. GIS, it's something we do and spatial analysis, it that ties in with that, right? Now, spatial analysis is not something that you can only do in GIS. It's something that all geographers do. And, you know, other people will do it. They'll, they'll you know, come into our, our territory here. They'll, they'll steal some of our tools and try to use it and, and not even give us credit for it. It's cool. We're, we're used to it, sociologists. Um, but the idea is... That within geography, we're doing spatial analysis, period. Right? It doesn't matter what kind of geography it is you're doing. You're studying where, right? The, the where of things. Where are things located? And our assumption is that where will help us get to why or how or, or whatever that, that kind of grander question is, right? It's the idea that by looking at the location of this one thing or multiple things, and, and typically we don't just look at one thing, we're looking at all sorts of different things and where they are located and how they're connected or not connected or whatever, right? But it's our assumption that by looking at that location, by looking at the where, that will help explain all this other stuff. That's the key thing. Like you talk to any geographer, pretty much what they're gonna tell you is that, yeah, the reason why people don't understand this thing or why the country's going to hell or whatever it might be is because we're not paying attention to the where and connecting that to everything else, right? So that's what spatial analysis is. We're analyzing, studying, looking at, you know, trying to get answers at this, this concept of where stuff is and why that matters, right? How these different locations influence um, whatever that end result is. Okay? That's the general idea here. Now within GIS, what's cool about having GIS is that we can really take that spatial analysis further. Doesn't mean it's necessarily better or the best way to do it or, or some kind of, you know, the pinnacle of spatial analysis because there are plenty of things that GIS just isn't 
great for. Um, yeah, and we'll, maybe we'll discuss some of that down the road or, you know, where it's, it's more useful than they're not. But it's not some hierarchy, right? It's not the idea that of geographers or of people doing spatial analysis, those who are using computers to do it are better. Uh, it's just, it's another way to do it. But you can definitely take things further simply because that computer is doing so much of the heavy lifting for you uh, in terms of math in terms of the artistry, in terms of all of this different stuff. Uh, a program like ArcGIS, which is what we're going to be using in this class, it automates so much of this stuff, or it's doing so much of it behind the scenes. We can do a lot more in a short amount of time than, than we could decades prior. So that's, that's the really cool thing about being able to do this within uh, a GIS environment. It means we can do some pretty complex math, without having to remember how, how that math actually works, right? We'll talk about spatial statistics. And it's the thing where you need to understand what the, uh, um, you know, what that, that tool is, what that specific statistical uh, method is, what it's doing, when you use it, when you don't use it, and, and all of that. But the computer is going to do all of the heavy-duty math for you, Right makes life so much easier and and it allows us to to ask some questions that are you know that are, are we can basically we can do more just with hey, i'll get i'll get to it i'm tired i'm and, and here's the issue i want to take a drink of water in a classroom setting wouldn't be a big deal but now i'm totally self-conscious about the fact that this is all being recorded you seen guys like wasn't it marco rubio at some speech or whatever, he had to drink water and he kind of panicked because he didn't need to do it. I think Trump did something too with like two hands or whatever. I don't remember. And of course, when I saw that stuff, I mocked it. Ah, dummies don't even know how to drink. And now I've got to drink water in front of a camera. And I don't, I just, I don't want to look like a lizard person or, or something. So, so bear with me. Here, here it goes. Did that work? I hope it, I hope it worked. I don't know. All right. Okay. So hopefully you get a sense of what spatial analysis is. And then the key thing with that, one thing I did not yet mention, is that when we are doing spatial analysis, it was not already obvious, the data with which we are working, they need to be tied to location in some way. So that's the key thing. Is with all these, you know, these questions that we're asking, and therefore the, you know, the data sets we'll get to try to answer said questions it's got to be tied to location in some way tied to place and that can happen at a variety of different scales right we can have things tied to the country right so we have some kind of rate um you know disease rate some specific disease by country and we can compare you know how's the u.s doing compared to canada or mexico or you know in other parts of the world like whatever right we can do that. And that's that's spatial. We can we can study things based on location there. And the idea too is that in doing so, not just looking at you know disease rates, period, across humanity, the assumption is that if we're looking at it based on the country uh, in question, we can say, okay, this country has has fewer rates of this disease because there there's you know there's a reason. For it, right, because they're they're investing more in healthcare or or prevention uh, methods or, or whatever, right? Let's uh, like let's just say hypothetically, right, that you have some kind of pandemic going on, some some worldwide fast spreading disease. I don't. I'm I'm trying not to let you know when I'm recording this, but let's just say there's a pandemic. Uh, at work and you can look at different countries and you can get a sense of oh this country you know over here uh yeah they had a, a spike here and then and then it went away and then they're cool and they're having like concerts and, and things like that now and then this other country uh over here and let's just make up a name like America. um let's say you know they have this spike and and then it and spike and, and more spikes and you know like why why is that and we can get into things like the concept of a lockdown right or actually putting on a mask or, or things like that uh you know it, it's tied to the government it's tied to the the population uh you know the citizens themselves it's tied to a whole host of things so again the idea is 
That where plays a big role. It helps to explain why. Why, you know, a disease is still spreading like crazy after a, a year of it spreading like crazy and all that. All right, so that's that's the deal. We Everything we're doing here, it's gotta be tied to location, okay? But here's the deal. When we're doing this kind of spatial analysis, there are a lot of key problems that pop up that if we're not aware of, if we're not careful about, we're gonna easily you know, slip into these little traps and our analysis isn't gonna be that great, all right? So we wanna think, the first thing, I wrote my notes, so I don't forget anything. Yes, defining our spatial units, our, our, our boundaries, right? The, the where we're actually studying. Because one thing we do when we're studying stuff, like yes, we could study individuals, right? We could look at individual people in an area and, and study those folks. That might be like downright impossible to do just in terms of the logistics of, of like, you know, asking people questions or recording the data or, or whatever. So we'll lump it together into, you know, regions, right? Cities or counties or states or countries or something along those lines. We like to lump uh, the, the data into these geographic units to make it a little easier to study. And what we need to do, this is all tied into scale, right? The, you know, like how, how what's the resolution? I'm going to think of it that way. Think in terms of like, like uh, digital images and, and stuff like that. What's the resolution of our data, right? Are we going to be, or are we zooming in or zooming out? You know, that's what we're, we're thinking of here. So if I study something at, say, the state level, right? Uh, the 50 states in the United States, I'm looking at it by state, that can be great. I can be looking at, you know, whatever it is, population, or again, disease rate. Let's do that. Let's stick with this, you know, hypothetical pandemic. Let's say we're, we're looking at diseases across the United States and we're mapping it by state. And you, you see that a lot. If you go online and you're looking at like coronavirus stuff, you're, um, uh, you know, you're going to see that where this, this state, it's a darker color because it has more cases of COVID-19, right? And this this state here, it has a lighter color because it has less cases. We're gonna get into all of that stuff, the the why we do it, the mechanics of these choropleth maps and different ways to map, you know, the most and the least uh, of things and have these quantitative relationships and, and all that stuff. We'll get into that, but, but you get the idea, right? But here's the deal. When I've decided to map it based on states, I, I can't then, unless I have some other backup bit of data, I can't really make any more assumptions at a better resolution or a finer resolution than that. I can't go into, say, California and get a sense of exactly what's going on within that one state because my data don't tell me that, right? I just have a really dark red, let's say, for the state of California that tells me that, yeah, California has a lot of these cases, um, but it doesn't, like, I can't tell where they are right, based on, on those data alone anyway, um, you know, you might know if you live in, say, Los Angeles County, that this place is hard hit. It's where the good majority of the cases are, right, down here in, in good old Los Angeles County, um, but you wouldn't know that, that, like, you know, this area is really hard hit, and you go out to other counties in the state, and they're dealing with it, but it's not the same amount and all that. You can't see them, because your map, you know, your original thing or the data that, that you took, they're at that state level, right? So we need to think about that. Number one, um, you know, is, is how are we going to lump this stuff together, group it to be able to map it and analyze it, compare things and, and all of that, right? Another issue with this, um, in coming up with our spatial units, I, I use the Antelope Valley, it's a great example, but honestly, like the greater Los Angeles area in, in general works here too. But the Antelope Valley, since this is, you know, an ABC thing, this will make the most sense for you guys watching this. Um, think about Lancaster and Palmdale, right? Two, if you ask the mayor of Lancaster and the mayor of Palmdale, my God, these are different cities. They are so different. Oh, it's laughable to think they're the same. But if you actually just... If you're just cruising around here, 
driving around do you do you notice a, a real difference honestly no right and is there a is there a clear border between these two maybe that's another way to to ask about it like if you're in palmdale and you've got to go to lancaster do you have to go through some checkpoint or across through some uh, um you know barrier wall or, or drive over a bridge or something like that no right you just you kind of stumble across avenue m or whatever and you're like oh i'm in lancaster now oh yeah okay and it doesn't uh, and that doesn't matter right apart from like having different things in the different you know the college is here uh, on this side of the city limits and and the mall is over here on this other side and all that it's all kind of the same thing right so if i'm going to study if i'm mapping something let's say covid rates let's stick with it shall we let's look at covid19 these disease rates if i'm studying covid cases in Lancaster, California, I can I can get individual you know uh, uh, cases of this stuff. I can map that out. That's all well and good, but the problem is if I don't also include Palmdale. And while we're at it, let's get in you know Quartz Hill and maybe you know you can question: Do I need Rosamond or or Lake LA or some of these other places, right? But if I'm not including some of these other spots, I might get an answer that isn't really reflecting what's happening in reality, right? Because I've ignored all this stuff. Think about how disease, you know, is just transmitted, how it moves from one individual to another. It doesn't recognize the the clear distinction between Lancaster and Palmdale. No, right? If somebody sneezes on me, right at, you know, Avenue M, I'm on the Lancaster side, they're on the Palmdale side. It doesn't really matter, right? Which side it is. So maybe... Again, depending on the nature of what it is I'm studying, what I'm, I'm trying to do, you just want to be aware of it. it. You know, study the greater Antelope Valley, right? Or same thing like with, you know, with L.A. in general. Just to say L.A. means so many different things to so many different people. So think about that. If you're studying something in Los Angeles, do you need to incorporate everything? Do you basically need to go down to San Diego, uh, you know, and up to Bakersfield? Uh, or can you just keep it? within Santa Monica or South LA or, I don't know, Monterey Park or, you know, whatever. You, you get what I'm saying, hopefully. Again, if we are in a classroom, I would know you get what I'm saying because you'd say, I get what you're saying. Hopefully you get what I'm saying. So, so think about that. And then also, one final thing on this idea of our units of analysis. In fact, there's a good, really good piece outlining this stuff. I'll put... I don't remember the guy's name. I don't have the link, but I'll put it in the description of the um, of the video itself. But there's a good article on why not to use zip codes for spatial analysis. And we tend to think, we get this quite a bit, right? Sometimes you're at a store and they ask you, you know, what's your zip code to get a sense of where their customers are coming from, where to put a new whatever it is, whatever store it is, right? Like if you have more people coming from this zip code, oh, maybe we should put one here to capture these uh, customers or something along those lines. But this guy's argument is, hey, don't do that. Uh, it's ridiculous. And what it really comes down to, it's the history of what a zip code is, and it's all connected to mail delivery routes and not necessarily neighborhoods, right? Um, it, it's You can kind of get a general sense based on zip codes of where something is, when you see that zip code, like again, with the Antelope Valley, and it's also in, in LA in general, you see the zip code, you start to recognize these things, oh, okay, it's east side, west side, whatever. Um, but it's connected with, with you know mail delivery routes. It's not necessarily indicative of a community, right? a group of people that interact. And that's addresses in general, all sorts of stuff like that. It's very arbitrary, and it's done for a specific reason. It's done for administrative purposes, logistical purposes, not necessarily going to matter with, with what it is you're studying, All right? So not only, you know, what kind of, of uh, uh, units am I using, the scale, say, city level, county level, state level, country level, that kind of stuff, um, but also, you know, how do I lump together regions? Where, do my, where does my analysis begin and end and, and that kind of stuff? But also, are these units of study that I'm using, do they actually mean anything like I think they should? Are they actually useful for what it is I'm trying to get at? If you're studying you know, mail delivery, zip code's fantastic. 
right? If you're studying disease transmission, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Unless it's like the mail carrier who's infected, I guess. You, know, you get what I'm saying. Again, hopefully. Okay, so there's that. Um, let's see. Oh, here's another thing. So going back to, to this idea of scale, right? And individuals... And, and, you know, kind of larger units, larger political units and stuff like that. That can be a really tricky thing to, um, to work across scales, right, in, in this way. And one example of this, just from the news, again, I always try to not get into, like, what's going on at the exact moment I'm recording stuff so I can recycle this, this sucker and not have to, to, you know, repeat my effort. Working smarter, not harder. Yeah. Um, but so right now, uh, Texas, uh, it's a complete mess. All right. It's a cold uh, weather coming in, electrical grid disaster, all that kind of stuff. What um, What is amazing about this to me, uh, apart from, I mean, it's not even amazing that this happened. It's frankly, our infrastructure is garbage and, and it's been, it don't, don't get me started on the privatization of this stuff. Um, but what amazes me about this are some of the responses by people uh, watching this that, you know, I've just seen online where people are saying, yeah, well, that's what you get for voting for Trump or something like that, right? Which is, is mind blowing to assume that because like when we looked at uh, um, the political map on election night, you know, and you're watching which one went blue, which one went red for Trump and Biden and, and all that. It's the assumption that, okay, Texas was a red state. Therefore, every single person in that state, uh, they're all, you know, we picture like Yosemite Sam. They're all shooting their guns up in the air and they love they love Trump and, and all that. And then California went blue, right, for Biden. So therefore, everybody in California, all pot smoking hippies and, and yeah, all of them. Yeah. And so it's the idea... That if some disaster happens in California, you know, the Yosemite Sam people will go, well, that's what you get for voting for Biden. And then if it happens in Texas, that's what you get for voting for Trump. That's ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous, but we do it. That's one of these spatial analysis fallacies that we have is where we, we take this big unit and based, you know, based on some type of analysis, some type of data or whatever, and, and the scale at which we're working there. And then we try to work down to that individual level. That never works. We can always go up, right? We can go from the individuals and then generalize at the state level. But once we've generalized at that state level, we can't ungeneralize. We can't go back down from that generalized data and make assumptions about what's happening at the more local individual level, right? And this is why, too, as we're working, whenever you're working with some kind of data set, it's good to have backups and and to keep stuff so that as you are generalizing things as you are lumping things together and you decide you know what actually I shouldn't have done that or now I want to ask this other question you know I need to go back to the individual you always want to have those backups because once you once you're going up this way it's it's impossible to go back down unless you've got that original stuff all right so keep that that in mind oh and then and then um the final just kind of problem that we have that I'll continue to remind you guys of as we go through the class is just from where did our data originate, right? We're working with some data set, typically in, in GIS at this academic level, when you're in college, when you're taking these classes, learning how to do this stuff, you're going to, uh, you're going to go online. You're going to, you know, do some kind of Google search. That's whatever your, your subject area is, GIS data attached to that right and see what you can find and pull this stuff down so chances are at this point anyway you're not going out and making it acquiring the data yourself right you're not out with a gps receiver or combing through you know whatever uh, records to compile something or, or whatever it's been assembled by somebody and delivered to you in some kind of form that's that's uh, compatible with gis but you need to be asking where does this really come from, right? And and it's it, we we tend to, with especially with digital stuff, but just with government data in general, we tend to assume that that stuff is perfect, um, that it's good. We can trust it. It's authoritative. Why? 
It's a game from the government. And saying that, like you might hear me say that and you're like, ah, no, the government is not good or not competent or, you know, whatever. Um, here's the deal. We can know that. We can feel that. We can, you know, say all the time, like, oh, those, those dummies in Washington or Sacramento or whatever, uh, they, don't, they don't know what's going on. Oh, they're all corrupt. And blah, 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 blah. But then when it comes time to look at some government document, we treat it as gospel. We treat it as the truth that has been put down in front of us by some divine being. Because it's, it's just that concept of authority. We're trained to think that way. And there's nothing wrong with assuming that, that something is good, uh, you know, competent data, but we just need to be aware of it. I mean, like, and it's this happens all the time, right? Look at where I'm sitting right now. Do you honestly think, have you noticed, if you've been paying attention um, to, to the full, you know, mise en scene uh, that's right here? Look at all these books behind me. Of course, I put my camera up in front of this stuff. Uh, it, it gives it that air of, Authority. I mean, my God, listen, listen to this guy talk. He sounds ridiculous, but do you see the books behind him? He's clearly, clearly a, a man of, of knowledge and science and, and all that. Maybe. I don't know if it works. Or you looked at it and you're like, God, who is this asshole, right? I, I get it. That, that happens too. But it's the idea that when you have, I mean, this is classic academic backdrop stuff. We all do this with our Zoom uh, meetings. We try to make it, uh, you know, look like, oh, oh, you know, we we pull the book, uh, you know, from here we're reading, oh, is it time for the meeting? And then we put it back to make it look like we're constantly, you know, thinking and learning and, and brilliant. Now it's all smoke and mirrors, right? That's exactly what this is uh, back here, right? It, it's kind of the same thing with these government agencies. Not so much that they're trying to trick you with this stuff but we tend to think oh this came from the usgs it's got to be good this came from the cdc got to be good or you know the lapd or sd or you know whatever right we get that official stuff and we go with it but we want to ask how do they get it right where did this how did this start out and so looking at the metadata right the data about the data, the the stuff that's telling you, okay, these data, they were compiled this way. They came from this source. Um, it was developed by this agency. It, it uh, was, uh, um, you know, acquired at this specific uh, point in time, at this specific place, and so on. That's really, really key. And that gets back into things like with this, this idea of generalization and not being able to generalize data and then work backwards. We get that data set, you know, that's made at a specific scale. And that's the scale at which we should be working with it. So if we get something that's just way too coarse and it's not going to give us information about local events, well, then we certainly shouldn't be using it for some kind of spatial analysis where we're trying to get information for local events, right? Local things that are taking place. It's, it's you got to question that. I've got this national data set but I'm interested in Southern California, is it going to work? At what scale was this created, right? So think about that. That's another common problem. We find whatever we can online, throw it into the GIS, we work our magic, all the stuff you're going to learn how to do. And the answers we get, it turns out they're not that good because the scale just doesn't match the analysis. All right, so that's another problem to think about as we move forward. But it's not, we'll just leave the problems there. That's some stuff to worry about. But what you're gonna start doing with these initial exercises that I'm having you guys do, we're gonna follow along with, with ESRI, or I guess they're calling themselves Esri now. It used to be, my God, let me tell you, it used to be ESRI. And if you said Esri, which we all did, just to kind of piss them off to fight the evil corporation and all that. But if you said Esri, they didn't like it at all there were esri it stood for what is it environmental systems research institute or something again clunky kind of like gis is clunky but you said esri now and all their their stuff that they put out it's all lowercase and they call it esri to like make it sound more fun and friendly i think they're just trying to like reclaim esri which used to be a great slur a great you know you could just say like yeah i'm not not fully buying all the stuff you're selling me and, and all that i'm fine you have that resistance right can't do it now. i guess maybe it is if i keep calling them esri i don't know esri esri whatever they've got it set up 
with, with their concept of teaching spatial analysis. They have things like mapping where things are and the most and the least and density and, and stuff like that. I'm going to follow through that because I think it is a good format for studying this stuff. So in the initial things that you're working through that I give you, you're going to be just mapping where things are, right? Location. And that may seem quite simple. It doesn't have that very sexy, um, you know, spatial analysis feel to it. You're not clicking all sorts of stuff and, and having amazing results, you know, spit out. You're just, hey, here's, here's where this thing is. But just that idea, just being able to map where things are, that's big. That's still spatial analysis. We're going to get into more complex stuff, but it's, it's good to be able to do that. And there are some questions you need to ask, some problems you're faced with, where simply figuring out where stuff is, that's all you need to do. Right? Don't we don't have to overthink it. We don't have to get into complex, you know, spatial statistics and modeling and, and that kind of stuff, 3D analysis. No, we just need to know where where is this thing? Right? So that's what you're doing. And what GIS allows us to do is we're easily able to uh, we can map where things are, but we can bring other things in there, right? Put other stuff on top uh, of these things. Uh, that's the whole idea of you know overlaying features. So that's what you'll you'll kind of start doing. It'll be a refresher for most of you, I'm sure, but just keep that in mind. And that's pretty that's pretty cool stuff to be able to do it. So whatever it is you're studying, again, you're some kind of ecologist, uh you need to be able to map, you know, where um we've got these these uh animal sightings, right? From some field work we're out looking for them whatever critters it is we're looking for, we, we spotted them here, here, and here, so we can plot that stuff. But then we can also bring, say, vegetation in there to, to see, is there some kind of correlation or causation or something, some kind of link between the plants that are there, the dominant vegetation in an area, and where we're seeing and therefore not seeing the specific species, right? So we can think of it that way. Uh, other stuff, right? the crime... Um, Analysis stuff is always really easy to give examples of uh, in here. It's the idea. You've got crimes, and so we can we can map those. But if you simply map crimes, it's just going to be a bunch of points in this white, empty space, right? It's not going to tell you much just in and of itself. So we bring in the roads and the businesses, and maybe we bring in this and that, these other things, and we start to overlay all of it to try to get some kind of, figure out some kind of pattern. Right, try to get a sense of okay, why why are these crimes taking place, or do we see are they happening in a specific area more often than elsewhere? Right, it's a common thing, but it's also a case. Just keep this in mind as you're starting to map where things are. Think about like with the stuff that you're working on here, but also as you're thinking about you know stuff you want to do like crime mapping. Oh, it's a great thing. Not only is it great for examples, but it's a great way to show how not to do this stuff. That crimes are so complicated. I mean, the idea, you know, it's uh, burglary is burglary or whatever. You can say that. But it's it anything that's done by humans and in human settlements, there's a lot of, of stuff going on, a lot of variables that come in. I use these examples. And like my cultural geography class, um, you know, the intro class, I like to, to use that. Some of you guys maybe have, have seen that, where I, I throw up the crime data, show where it is, and I'm, I'm showing you all sorts of spatial, you know, trickery and, and all this stuff and say, oh, look, and there's where the crime's going. And then ask you, like, is that scary? And, and a few brave students will say, yeah, wait a second, what do, you, what do you mean crimes? Like, what kind of crimes? And of course, I've mapped every single crime available. So it's like homicide and jaywalking all together. Right, to, because it looks scarier, because there's more of this stuff coming in. Um, so it's you know what exactly are we mapping, right? What exactly are we overlaying? What are we showing? How are we doing this stuff? As simple as this, you know, mapping where things are is or seems to be, right? The act of just adding two layers, putting them on top of one another, we still want to be thinking about that. What am I actually? mapping? What am I trying to get at? Do I need all of these data or should I filter this out? Should I be, be more specific with what I'm mapping, what I'm bringing in and, and that kind of stuff, right? Simple as it seems, mapping where this stuff is, you can see it's it takes a very skilled individual to be able to properly do it. And hey, 
Hey, my little skilled individuals, that's what you're going to be when we get through the end there. All right. Okay. This is, uh, that does it for me. I've rambled long enough in front of my very academic backdrop here. Um, so yeah, take that, go forth and, and do some mapping, whatever it is I've assigned to you at this point. Uh, and, and stay tuned for another one of these where I talk about whatever it is I talk about. All right. All right. Uh, ha happy mapping. Yeah.